we initially presented the central limit theorem as a means of understanding the rate of convergence in the strong law of large numbers. But what about the rate of convergence in the central limit theorem? The strong law of large numbers is a statement about convergence of a sequence, and so it's natural to discuss its rate of convergence. But the notion of convergence in the central limit theorem is weak convergence, or convergence in distribution. The standardized sum of those iid random variables doesn't usually converge in a conventional sense. So if we want to measure the rate of convergence, we have to decide what our metric, what our distance measure on probability measure should be. One possibility would be to use the total variation metric. We take the supremum over all measurable sets of the difference between the measures involved. Unfortunately, this will not work in most interesting cases. As we saw, the total variation metric always assigns maximum distance one to any pair of probability measures that are mutually singular. If we take, for example, the first central limit theorem that we saw, where the input random variables are discrete Rademacher variables, that means that the standardized sum, which is also a discrete shifted binomial distribution, will have total variation distance one from the Gaussian for all finite stages of the theorem. So that's not going to work. But let's consider some other possible metrics that are of the same flavor. And by flavor, I mean that we should remember the following theorem that we proved in an earlier lecture. We could also express the total variation distance as the supremum over all bounded measurable functions h, with supremum less than or equal to 1, of the difference between the integral of h d mu and the integral of h d nu. That means that total variation distance is an example of a dual probability metric. That is, a metric of this precise form here. We decide to measure distance by testing against some functions. And the distance measure's strength is determined by which functions we're allowed to test against. So the metric is determined by this class of functions h. In the total variation distance, the class of functions is the bounded measurable functions. In order to account for this one half, we'd better make them of supremum no more than two. Now that's too strong a metric for the central limit theorem, and so we need to take a smaller class of functions here in order to get a metric that will work better. Now we have to be careful, because if we make this class of functions too small, this will no longer be a metric. It's easy to verify that this is always a pseudometric, but what can fail as usual is the separation of points. So we need a sufficiently rich class of functions here in order for this to be a genuine metric. Here is an example, the Kolmogorov metric, which is a metric on probability measures on the real line. The Kolmogorov distance between two measures is the supremum of the difference between their CDFs. In other words, it's equal to the dual metric generated by all of the functions of this form indicator of a half infinite interval from minus infinity up to t supremumed over all real numbers t. This seems like a pretty small class of functions, actually. It's just a one parameter set, but it turns out to be strong enough to make this into a metric. And in fact, it's a pretty strong metric. It's too strong to metrize weak convergence. That is to say, if I have a sequence of probability measures that converges in this metric, it will certainly converge weakly but we know that weak convergence, a la the portmanteau theorem, is equivalent to pointwise convergence of the CDFs to the CDF of the target at the continuity points of the target CDF. So if one of our two measures here is absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue measure, then this metric exactly metrizes weak convergence to that measure. But in general, this is stronger than weak convergence. I'd like to now introduce, or I should say reintroduce, another probability metric that is going to play a role in our deliberations in the next few lectures, and that is the Wasserstein L1 metric. On probability measures on the real line, we define the following metric. It is a dual metric, dual to Lipschitz functions with Lipschitz norm less than or equal to 1. Just as a reminder, that means functions so that the ratio f at x minus f at y over x minus y remains bounded by 1 for all choices of x and y. Of course, differentiable functions satisfy this constraint, 
And if f is differentiable, then the Lipschitz norm is the supremum of its derivative. Lipschitz functions are not necessarily differentiable. For example, a function like this is Lipschitz, and its Lipschitz norm will be the maximum of the absolute value of these slopes. What is true in this example and in general is that Lipschitz functions are differentiable almost everywhere. And better than that, they're what's called absolutely continuous, which is something we'll come up in the next lecture. Now this dual metric is indeed a genuine metric. One way to see that is again to use the portmanteau theorem for equivalent formulations of weak convergence. Since weak limits are unique, you'll get separation of points from this metric since weak convergence can be described in terms of testing against Lipschitz functions. Now Lipschitz functions are not necessarily bounded, and so this is not automatically a weaker notion of convergence than total variation. If you add the bounded constraint here and only take the supremum over bounded Lipschitz functions, whose bound is less than or equal to 1 as well, then in fact it's a theorem that that metrizes weak convergence on the real line. That is, you get convergence in that metric if and only if you get weak convergence. Now it also might look confusing because there's something ostensibly different that we call the Wasserstein distance in lecture 21.2. Well, these two are actually the same, and that's a major theorem, that this dual metric here, taking the supreme over testing against all lip1 functions, also can be calculated by taking the infimal L1 difference between two random variables, where the infimum is taken over all couplings of the two measures. That's what we called the Wasserstein L1 distance before, and it is actually equal to this quantity here. And there's an intervening definition that also is equal to these other two. It's nothing other than the L1 distance on the real line with respect to the Lebesgue measure between the CDFs. We could spend a whole lecture or more going through a proof that these three are equal, but I'm not going to do that. I recommend instead, if you're interested in questions like this, that you start reading any of a number of excellent books on optimal transport theory or concentration of measure. We're going to work with this formulation of the Wasserstein metric because it's ideally set up for some calculations that we're going to do to provide some precise quantitative information about the rate of convergence in the central limit theorem and even more interesting questions after that. Before we head down that road, I want to show you that this Wasserstein metric actually controls the Kolmogorov distance, at least in the case where one of the two measures is absolutely continuous. Here's the proposition. If nu is an absolutely continuous measure with a bounded density, the density with respect to the Lebesgue measure has to be bounded by some potentially large but finite constant c everywhere on the real line, then for any other probability measure, absolutely continuous or not, the Kolmogorov distance, remember that's the supremal difference between their CDFs, is less than or equal to two times the square root of that constant times the Wasserstein distance. This is actually kind of remarkable. It says that the Wasserstein distance, which by one of the equivalent formulations on the last slide, is the L1 norm relating the two CDFs, controls the supremum norm between the two CDFs. It's actually not that surprising, however, because we're imposing a constraint on the density, which is the derivative of the CDF. And so those of you who are interested in analysis may note that this has the flavor of a Sobolev type theorem. But don't worry about that if it's not to your taste. To prove this theorem, what we'd really like is for the test functions used in the Kolmogorov metric, that is those indicator functions of half infinite intervals, to be Lipschitz functions, the kind that we're testing against here. Of course, they're not Lipschitz. They're not even continuous. But we can approximate that indicator function from above and below by Lipschitz functions. So let's do that explicitly here. For each t, we can fix for each epsilon a Lipschitz function like this, which approximates the indicator function of the interval from minus infinity up to t. We can bound it from below or from above. These are functions that are constantly equal to 1 or 0 nearly everywhere that the indicator function is, but have a continuous slope down, and the slope is 1 over epsilon, so that as epsilon goes to infinity, we get pointwise convergence everywhere except potentially at the point t to the indicator function. 
Now these are piecewise differentiable functions, and so they are Lipschitz. Their Lipschitz norms are equal to the supremum of their slopes, and so we get a bound of 1 over epsilon. If we're going to test with respect to Lipschitz 1 functions for the Wasserstein metric, we need to use Lip 1 functions, but that's okay because we can scale these. If I take a function which has a high slope and I just scale the whole function down, that scales the slope down as well. In other words, the Lipschitz norm is 1 homogeneous. Epsilon f will have Lipschitz norm equal to epsilon times the Lipschitz norm of f. And that means that we can use the functions epsilon times psi plus or minus. These are going to be Lipschitz 1 functions. Now the indicator is stuck in between psi minus and psi plus point-wise. That's how we designed it. And so in testing for the Kolmogorov distance, which means testing this and then taking a supremum over t, we're going to bound the two sides here, and we'll start with an upper bound. This is less than or equal to psi plus, and so these difference of integrals is less than or equal to the integral of psi plus against mu minus this term here. And what we'll do is, as usual, add zero in the form of minus something plus itself in order to make the comparison easier. So what we're going to do is subtract the integral of psi plus against d nu and add it back in. And now we'll compare these two and compare those two. For the first two terms, we'd like to compare this, as we're trying to do, to the Wasserstein 1 distance, which means that we need to use a lip 1 function here, so we'll replace psi plus with epsilon times psi plus, but that means that we need to take a 1 over epsilon out. Now, this is the difference when integrating mu versus nu against a lip 1 function, and so by definition, it's less than or equal to the Wasserstein distance between those two measures, and therefore this whole first term is less than or equal to 1 over epsilon times the Wasserstein distance between mu and nu. For the other term, psi plus and this indicator function agree with each other everywhere except on the interval from t up to t plus epsilon. And so, since the difference there is a slope between 0 and 1, this whole difference is less than or equal to the indicator function of that small interval. Now nu is assumed to be of the form rho dx, where dx means the bag measure here, and rho is less than or equal to c. And therefore, this whole second term is just less than or equal to c times epsilon. So what we've got is that this term without absolute values, the thing we're trying to take the supremum of in order to get the Kolmogorov metric, is less than or equal to 1 over epsilon times the Wasserstein distance plus c times epsilon. And that's true for any positive epsilon. Now, we're not going to send epsilon to 0 here, clearly. We're not going to send epsilon to infinity either. What we want to do is optimize this bound by choosing the epsilon, which will make it smallest. And that's a problem for first-year calculus. You can do that optimization problem on the back of an envelope right now, and you'll find that the optimizing value of epsilon is the square root of the Wasserstein metric divided by that constant c. And if you plug that in to this bound, you get this as an upper bound. Similarly, we'll use psi minus to prove the reverse inequality on the other side in order to take the absolute value. We'll get exactly the same calculation out. And so for every value of t, since this optimal value here doesn't depend on t, we get this as an upper bound, and therefore this is also true for the supremum over t, which gives us the Kolmogorov metric and the control that we were trying to prove. Now, if we're interested in a quantitative central limit theorem, that we want to apply this in the case where one of those measures, say nu, the one with the bounded density, is a normal random variable because the normal density is in fact bounded. As usual, we'll apply a metric on measures to random variables by just applying it to the distributions of those random variables. And so putting this together, what we see is that for a standard normal distribution, the Kolmogorov distance between any random variable and it is bounded by 2 times the square root of the Wasserstein distance between them. And that's because the supremum of the normal density is 1 over square root of 2 pi, which is less than or equal to 1. We could put a smaller constant there, but we're not so interested in exact constants right now. Let me conclude this lecture by noting where we'd like to go in principle from here. We would like to prove the classic Berry-Essene theorem, which is the 
optimal theorem for the rate of convergence of the central limit theorem in the Kolmogorov distance. Just like in order to get a decent rate of convergence, the universal one over square root of n in the strong law of large numbers, we needed to assume the random variables are actually one step more integrable, L2 instead of L1. For the Beria-Seen theorem, we need to assume that the random variables are one step more integrable than in the standard central limit theorem, L3 instead of L2. The theorem says that if xn is an iid sequence of L3 random variables, and let's standardize from the start so that they are centered, have variance one, and let's call that common third absolute moment upsilon cubed, then the standardized sum has Kolmogorov distance from a normal, which is bounded by a constant times that third moment divided by root n. Now that root n rate is optimal. You cannot do better than that, even if you have lots of integrability around. As for the constant here, the best known estimate for it is about 0.4748. It's also known from Essene's earlier work that it's bigger than about 0.41. So we're narrowing down on it. This was proved in 2011 and was the result of many, many steps in between. But again, we are not interested particularly in best constants here. The best rate is something we would love to achieve. This is a very useful quantitative theorem. Remember, this Kolmogorov distance is the supremum over real numbers t of the difference between the CDFs. The CDF of a standard normal, often called phi, or erf, is one of the most commonly used lookup table functions in all of science. And so this theorem not only tells us that we get convergence to a normal random variable, but it tells us that in terms of the CDF, which is the usual practical way to measure them, the rate of convergence is right here with explicit constants. We're not actually going to prove this theorem with the optimal rate. What we're going to do instead is prove the same theorem, but instead of with the Kolmogorov distance here, the Wasserstein distance. Now, by this theorem here, that means we'll also get a Kolmogorov bound, but it will not be of the proper rate. But that's okay. We're going to see why this theorem is true and what the Gaussian measure has to do with the limit in this quantitative way without having to understand things about Fourier analysis. And the starting point will be to go back to Gaussian integration by parts.